God's children said? Amen. 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 All right, church, where are we at? All right. If you're visiting with us, we've been going through Psalm 23, phrase by phrase. I used to say verse by verse, but this one's been a little different. Amen? So you stand and let's, you know the drill. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Father, would you speak to us in a very personal way tonight? Open your word, open our eyes. And let us see the glorious provision you have for us. In Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we spent a few weeks on verse 4. And we saw that in verse 4, just to kindly remind us just for a moment, verse 4 is a transition in Psalm 23. If you remember what we looked at, verses 1, 2, and 3, speaks of a shepherd tending to the sheep in the, the winter and the early spring months. But then when the heat of the summer and early fall begins to take place, the shepherd will move the sheep from a place in the lowlands, or where, if, if you are been to Israel with me, where the Dead Sea lands are, and he would begin to take them to a journey to what we call the high mountain meadow land. But through that journey, they would have to go through a very dangerous valley like the valley of the shadow of death. And the sheep will have to be absolutely in step with the shepherd because if the sheep is not, then they would very easily fall to their death. And so the shepherd teaches them and trains them through the rod and the staff, cares for them through the staff. And when we come to verse 5, we have another transition in Psalm 23. You say, what's the transition now? Well, they've made it through the valley of the shadow of death, just as David said. They have now came to the high meadow lands, the high mountain meadows. And now they're grazing in the high meadows in the time of the summer, in the time of the early fall season. Now, let's walk through this phrase together for just a moment. I want you to look first at what's called the shepherd's preparation. Notice how it begins. Thou preparest a table before me. In other words, there's something the shepherd has to do to make this truth reality for the sheep. And you say, what is it? Well, he has to do preparation. Now, what does the shepherd do to prepare this for the sheep? Well, remember I told you one time before, that the shepherd, before he would take them to this journey to the high mountain meadow lands, he would first leave the sheep from time to time and he would go and scout out or look for the proper lands or the proper meadows that he can take these sheep to. He would look the pathway in which they would have to travel to get there. But when it came real close to time, For him to lead his flock across this journey and through these valleys and up into these mountaintops where it won't be so hot, the shepherd would take another hiatus from his flock and he would go up to this land that he's already scouted out and he would begin to prepare the land for his sheep. Now you say, what in the world will he do? Well, the first thing he will do is what I call the weeds of lawlessness. Now you say, what do you mean the weeds of lawlessness? Well, there are certain weeds that grow in these meadowlands, especially in Israel, that are extremely poisonous, especially to sheep. These weeds, if, if, if a sheep would eat of these weeds, and you have to understand, you put a sheep in a meadow, he'll eat anything he sees. 
And so it's not like a sheep knows what to not eat and what to eat. The sheep don't have any idea of what to eat and not eat. That's the reason the Bible says that you and I, as saved men and women, flock in his, being his, he being the shepherd, he gives us discernment to know what the things of God truly are. And so he gives us discernment to be able to feed on what is good for us, be able to not feed on what is bad for us. But can I tell you, for a sheep, the shepherd would have to prepare it. And you say, what do you mean? He would go up to that meadow land on that high mountain before he ever took the sheep up there, and he, on his hands and knees, would pull every weed that would be harmful to the sheep. Because those weeds would be poison for those sheep some of these weeds could literally lead to death but most of the time the poison of these weeds would lead to what would be called paralysis and it can literally shut down the nervous system of a sheep and so the shepherd before he'd ever leave his flock up there he would go and on his hands and knees one weed at a time he'd pull every weed out of that meadow now you say, why did you use the term weeds of lawlessness? Because can I tell you, sin is poisonous. Amen. And you and I need to understand that the preparation of our shepherd was on Calvary. Amen. And can I tell you, he left heaven. He came prepared for you and I a way in which you and I could feed in the midst of a world that is against God. But so what did he do? Well, can I tell you, the Lord Jesus took your weeds. He took your sin, and he bore it upon himself. And when Jesus Christ died for your sin and mine, well, that day he rose, can I tell you what happened? God plucked the weeds out of you. And here's the reality of it all. You and I now have, can have victory over sin in our life. We don't have to be paralyzed by sin. We don't have to be bound by sin anymore. Sin doesn't have to encage us anymore the Lord Jesus prepared a way because I'm gonna be honest if sin and self are two sides of the same coin how could we ever have peace enough to eat amongst our enemies if we don't have victory over sin it never happened. But let me show you a second thing the shepherd does in preparing this field. It's what I call the wickedness of lust. You say, what do you mean? Well, there's another dangerous thing for sheep in a strange land. You say, what is it? Serpents, snakes. You say, why? Because when number one, if a, if a sheep or a flock of sheep even suspect a snake anywhere near, they become so restless they won't eat. But at the same time, these, many of these serpents can be very poisonous as well. And the reality of it is, is this. The serpent, which by the way, characterizes the devil. Y'all remember, how did he appear to Eve as a serpent? What did he do as a serpent to Eve? He deceived her. What did he do to deceive her? He caused her to be able to lust after what God had forbidden. And so the shepherd will go, and here's what he'll do. He'll take, literally, hog's fat. And he'll take hog's fat, and he'll put it in the holes of these snake holes. And he'll put it in the entrances of these holes, and he'll stuck that hog's fat as deep as he can in those holes, and then he'll cause fire to come as he causes fire by rubbing those things together and all of a sudden he'll light that hog's fat in that hole and it'll drive those serpents out of that field can i tell you today that you and i were born with lust or desires that are poisonous Amen. and you and i were born with deception and you and i were born with that adam nature of self 
But aren't you glad today that Jesus not only took care of our sin in the realm of its penalty, but Jesus Christ, the Bible says, he became our sin. And listen, it's singular. You say, what do you mean? Hey, he took our sins, plural. That's our acts. But he became our sins, singular. That's the very nature that caused us to sin. And the Lord Jesus, now alive in the believer, guess what? He's able to overcome your selfish desires and lust. And he wins the victory for us. And he's our victory. And it's all because of the preparation that God the Father made through the Lord Jesus at Calvary that you and I can have the victory that we have. Let me show you a third thing that the shepherd does when he goes to this land. It's what I call the wiles of lions. And you say, what do you mean the wiles of lions? Well, every now and then he may go to a land and, and he'll find little entrances to dens or maybe even small caves and when you find dens and small caves in israel guess what it's a haven for wild animals and so what the shepherd would do is this one of two things if the opening to the den is small enough he'll take rocks or or something to that effect and he'll close out the opening so nothing can get in and nothing can get out But if the opening's too long, here's what he'll do. He'll take a knife, and he'll go in, and he'll hunt any prey that's in that cave or that den, and he'll slay it. You say, why? Because he'll rid the land of any praying animal that could come against his flock before he ever takes the flock up there. Now you say, well, preacher, how's that? relating to us because the bible says in first peter that the devil is a roaring what lion Lion. how many of you agree today that when jesus christ our shepherd prepared our way through the cross of calvary that through the death burial and resurrection that satan is defeated he's already been destroyed hey you say well he's still walking around but i got news for you he can't touch a child of god unless he goes through the father of the child and i want got news for you I don't have to fight against him. He's already defeated. I can just draw near to my shepherd, and my shepherd's already took care of my enemy. Amen. The wiles of lions. You see, the shepherd has to prepare the way for the sheep. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, I used this passage last week but i want to use it again for as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had power of death that is the what hey folks listen your problem and my problem is not the devil your problem and my problem is you and me Devil's already been dealt with. But see, you and I get in the way. We choose self over our shepherd. And that's when we get in trouble. But let me show you a fourth thing the shepherd does in preparing this land. It's what I call the waters of life. You say, what do you mean? Well, how many of you agree a, a land will not be sufficient if there's not water on it? So here's what happens. Remember when we, when we studied earlier about he, he brings us to the still waters? You remember what I told you then? What happens when a shepherd comes to a stream that's fast running water? They're scared. They spook. They won't drink because the noise and the movement scares them. So here's what the shepherd does. He'll go up to these meadow lands. He'll find a stream that's in those lands And he'll take sticks and he'll take rocks. And here's what he'll do. He'll dam up that little stream and he'll make puddles in that little stream that the sheep can go and stick their heads in that water, not having to worry about the noise, not having to worry about the moving water, not having to fret, not having to be scared, but be able to drink of the waters, still waters, and be able to refresh themselves from the waters the shepherd has provided. Well, isn't it true as well 
that when Jesus, our shepherd, prepared our way through Calvary, the Bible says that Christ had to die. But when he died, the Bible says that he would send the comforter, the parakletos. And the Bible says that the comforter will be what? A well of water springing up in you and I. And so the whole picture is that we can be refreshed every moment of every day because Jesus, our shepherd, had literally paid everything and, and he prepared everything for us. And now the Spirit of God can have liberty inside the believer because Jesus has provided the well. You see, these are the preparations of the shepherd. But let me show you secondly, not only the shepherd's preparation, but the shepherd's promise. How many of you would agree this would come at a heavy cost physically to that shepherd? I mean, you think about it. Getting on your hands and knees and plucking every weed out of a meadow. Going into a den with a knife and slaying a wild animal. Or taking rocks and building up a doorway to an entrance to a den. Or taking rocks and damming up water for a large flock to be able to drink out of. Can you imagine the price in which a shepherd would have to pay on a physical realm just that the sheep, when they get there, can eat and eat in peace? Comes at a heavy price. Well, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus pay a big enough price? Amen. Hey, I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price. And the ultimate price was the, his very life he laid down volitionally. Why? Because you and I, his sheep, one day he knew that ye had prepared a table before us and it was going to be in this world in the presence of our enemies and you and I could eat at that table and rest in peace and not have to worry. Cost him everything. Let me give you a picture of how this is pictured in Scripture. How many of you, you remember in Old Testament about Moses leading the children of Israel? And what happened? They got thirsty. Y'all remember that? Say amen. amen. And when they got thirsty, y'all remember this. I've, I've taught you part of this before. You remember what happened? Moses went to God and said, God, what do you want to do? I mean, listen, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill Moses. They, as a matter of fact, I, I'll go this far. They said, would to God we'd go back to Egypt. I mean, they wanted to go back under bondage of the taskmasters. And, and Moses went to God and said, God, what do you want to do? Hey, they're, they're after me, God. Help me. God said, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take them. I want you to take them this rock. Y'all remember this? What did God tell Moses to do? Take his staff and what? Strike the rock. And when he struck the rock, what happened? Water came out. All right, later on, what happened? They got thirsty again. Y'all remember what happened? Moses went to God. Now they're really mad. Hey, listen, they done had a Baptist business meeting and decided to vote him out. I mean, they were really mad now. And all of a sudden now, what happened? Oh, Moses went to God. He said, God, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to take them to a rock. He said, but Moses, I want you to listen to me. Don't strike the rock, just speak to the rock. You say, how in the world does this have anything to do with the price that our shepherd paid? I want you to listen to this. The word rock, the first time, is a Hebrew word that is to soar. It means an embedded rock. It means a rock that is embedded in a hillside. It, it speaks of a boulder-type rock embedded. How do you get, remove a boulder from an embedded place? You have to do it through force, through violence. And so what it pictures is when Moses took that staff and striped that rock, what is it saying? Well, the only way the water could come out was, guess what? First, there had to be the suffering of the Lord Jesus. The humiliation of the Lord Jesus. The blunt of the force of man and the blunt of the force of the world came down upon the Lord Jesus. 
But what if I told you that in the passage where the Lord said to Moses, don't strike the rock to speak to the rock. By the way, these are found in Exodus 17, 1 and Numbers 20, verse 8. In Numbers 20, verse 8, what if I told you the Hebrew word for rock there is a different word? The Hebrew word for in Numbers 20, verse 8 is shelah. And here's what it means. A lofty rock, a fortress rock. So why did the Lord's Father say to Moses, don't strike this rock, just speak to this rock? I want to tell you something. Because the Lord Jesus already took the blunt force of sin. The Lord Jesus already took the blunt force of man. The Lord Jesus already took the blunt force of hell. And the Lord Jesus resurrected. And when he resurrected, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, the majesty on hall. Hey, I got news for you. He's not on this earth. He's lofted in heaven, and he is our high priest. And can I tell you, you can't strike our high priest anymore. All you can do is speak to him. You see, he paid the price that he could be our shepherd, priest. All this pictured in the shepherd. Well, I want you to look thirdly at the shepherd's provision. Look at this verse with me. Thou preparest a table before me. The word table is a unique Hebrew word. Here's the way it's defined. A spread. Now, how many of y'all ever been to one of those buffets that make a tongue come out and slap your nose off your face? <laughs> yo, yo, yo. How, many of y'all, how many of you senior adults went to uh, uh, Lancaster with me? Raise your hand. Y'all remember when we went to Shady Maple? <laughs> y'all remember Shady Maple? I mean, listen, if you've never been to Shady Maple, I want to tell you something. I, I mean, listen, if, if you're not saved, you'll be saved time you get out of there. I, I mean, it is awesome. It, it, you say, what do you mean? Well, I want to tell you, you couldn't fit all the buffet lines in this room. I mean, I mean I'm talking about a place that seats probably three, 4,000 people, and the buffet lines go all the way down from one wall to the other. I mean, it's huge. Can I tell you, when you walk in a place like that, here's what you're going to say. Boy, what a spread. Amen? That's old Tennessee language. Y'all heard that language before, had not you? Here's what the word means, a spread out. It, it means this, a spread out meal. Let me tell you more specifically. It means a banquet. So here's the provision of the shepherd. He goes and he prepares the land. He removes the poisonous weeds. He takes care of the snakes and the serpents and the wild animals that could come against the flock. He prepares the water that they can drink. And now, here's this meadow land with dew upon the ground early in the mornings. And all of a sudden now, all across this little meadow land, here's this sheep, and they look. And can I tell you, if sheep could speak, they'd go, Wow, what a spread! Here's the picture. We live in a lost and dying world and they don't want anything to do with God. But can I tell you today, in the midst of our enemies, in the midst of our worldliness around us, can I tell you, God didn't just feed you manna. He didn't just feed you a little bit of corn. Hey, He's got a banquet for you. His provision is unending. Oh, the glory of it all. You see, the shepherd's provision for his sheep. Notice this, the shepherd's, the sheep's resources. What do you mean? Hey, can I tell you, life's a fight. How many agree the Bible says we're in spiritual warfare? Life's a fight. But let me ask you a question. If, if Christian life is spiritual warfare, who fights the battle? Not us. It's our shepherd. So in the, listen, listen, in the midst of the battlefield, there's a spread. There's a banquet. 
all the resources. You say, what are on this banquet? What are on this spread? Oh, I want to tell you something. In the midst of our enemies, can I tell you, you got the banquet. You got the every item that you need for the Christian life. The Bible says that we have the victory of Christ, the joy of Christ, the peace of Christ. We have the, we have the enabling of Christ. We have the power of Christ. Hey, can I go on and on? Hey, I'm telling you, hey, everything you need for the Christian life, you can find at the table God's prepared for you. Ephesians 1, 3. Y'all have heard me quote this a million times. He has given us all things, all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. You say, what do you mean? Everything we need, our shepherd's already provided. I don't have to ask for it. God's already gave it. I don't have to go and search for it. God's already gave it. I don't have to go and pray and, and literally train and struggle and strut and say, Oh, God, would you give me peace? Oh, God, would you give me victory? Oh, God, would you give me this? Hey, I got news for you. When I pray like that, I'm just showing my unbelief because my shepherd's already laid out a spread. And can I tell you what? All I need to do is pull myself up to the table and eat of the Lord because he is all those things for me. What do you do when you sit down at the table to eat? Do you pray? Hey, can you imagine? Think about this. You sit down at a table. And boy, listen, my mama's here. I have my figure because of my mama. <laughs> Y'all say amen. That woman can cook some vittles. I, I mean, listen, she'll have us over most Sundays for lunch. We'll get over there. That'll be meatloaf. Mashed taters. Y'all say amen. amen. Oh, listen. That'll be mashed taters. That'll be meatloaf. I, I mean, she'll have like, like peas or something like that. She'll have handmade yeast rolls. Y'all say amen. And then nana pudding. Y'all say, what's nana pudding? That's called banana pudding in y'all's vernacular. Amen. <laughs> Tennessee, we call it nana pudding. And, and all of a sudden... We'll sit down. Now, what would you think if I sat down and I'd say, Lord, I pray you'd give me something good to eat today. You're right. And she should, Wayne. Wayne said she'd knock me out. She, you're right. But can I tell you, that's what we do for God every day. God laid out a spread of victory, a spread of peace, a spread of joy, a spread of his love, a spread of his mercy, a spread of his grace. And every time we get in trouble, we say, God, I need. But what do you do when you sit down at a spread like that? You say, God, thank you. Now, we probably need to say, God, forgive me for what I'm about to do. But anyway, we, we don't. But you say what? God, thank you. You see, the sheep's resources are endless. You can never tap them out. They're endless. Notice the sheep's realization. There preparest a table before me. Before me. Notice he didn't prepare a table for himself. Thou prepared a table for what? Me. What's that confession of? Listen to me. Can a sheep prepare his own Meadowland? Can a sheep prepare his own table? It's a confession of absolute helplessness and hopelessness. As a sheep, my shepherd, you prepared for me who could not. You gave me who has not. 
everything I need. And it's right here before me. See, here's what a sheep realizes. Their shepherd is enough. Romans eleven twenty nine, 29. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. You say, what does that mean? He never goes back on what he is. What would happen if I walked up to Howie and I said, Howie, I know you've got a great need. Whatever I have. Don't worry, there's not a dime in it, okay? <laughs> there is a credit card, but it's got a limit on it. And it's the churches. <laughs> <laughs> Howie, whatever you need. Here it is. And Howie reaches out and grabs it. And I said, no. That's not our God. The gifts and calling our God are without repentance. He never has to repent for giving you his resources. And he never takes them back. Are y'all with me? They're yours forever. They're yours forever. Oh, let's go on. Notice next. Not only the sheep's resources and the sheep's realization but the sheep's rest so thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies and remember i told you with sheep brother james used to have sheep he'll confess this they hear a rustling in a tree or a bush they get spooked and they'll run to their shepherd. But the shepherd has done such a job of preparing the place. The sheep is able to keep his head down and eat of the green pastures. The sheep don't have to worry, don't have to fret. Don't have to wonder what's around the horizon or what's going to happen five minutes later. You see, the sheep, the only role they have is to eat what the shepherd prepared. Jesus said in John 6, drink of my blood and eat of my flesh. He didn't mean literally. But he meant it this way. Identify with me. Appropriate me in your life. Feed on me. Isn't that what Brad said this morning? Feed on his faithfulness. For he's enough. So you don't have to worry about the devil. Just feed on Christ. Just feed on Christ. The sheep's rejoicing. If you're hungry and you get through eating a spread, aren't you able to rejoice? Why? Because you're hungry has been taken care of. No wonder the Bible says, taste and see. The Lord, He is good. You say, what do you mean? Well, when you feed up on Christ, you find out. He's good. You know what that means? You'll want to go back for more when you get hungry enough.
the sheep to rejoice. Well, let me look at these last two things. Can y'all listen real quick? Say amen. I didn't get to preach this morning, so I'm making up for it tonight. Y'all say amen. amen. The shepherd's protection. So what's the shepherd doing while the sheep's eating at this spread? He's watching. He's guarding. And he's protecting his flock. Notice a couple of things. I'm going to run through these real quick, but I want you to see them. The watchful care of the shepherd. In other words, the shepherd stands guard. And as he stands guard, he's watching for any animal of prey. He's watching for anything that could come against his sheep. He's protecting his sheep. And so get the picture. The sheep have their head down into the meadows. They're eating of the meadows. They're not having to worry about what's going on over here. They're not having to worry about what's going over there. Why? Because they are dependent and they have learned to trust their shepherd that their shepherd is sufficient for their protection. Pictures the Lord Jesus as our high priest. And listen, folks, as Satan accuses us day and night, guess what? We have an advocate with the Father. Hey, if Satan sends an attack against us, can I tell you something? The Bible says in this world you shall have tribulation. But remember, I have overcome the what? We have a divine protector in the Lord Jesus. And as sheep, can I tell you something today? I don't have to fret. I don't have to worry. I don't have to wonder what's going to happen tomorrow. It don't matter what happens to me tomorrow. Hey, if you wake up tomorrow and find out your pastor's breathed his last breath, don't you weep, you shout, because I have been taken care of by my shepherd. (coughs) He watches over. He's a strong tower in time of need. The warring care of the shepherd. What if an enemy does come against him? I mean, does the sheep have this call in which all of a sudden they circle up like the troops used to against the Indians years ago trying to protect themselves? The sheep come together and said, all right, guys, let's mobilize and let's protect ourselves. Is that what happens? No. Here's what the sheep do. They just keep eating. Because, see, it's not their battle to fight. The shepherd fights their battles for them. Can I tell you, I, I did a little study on this. Bless my heart. And one, one man who, who was a shepherd in England for years and years and years, here's what he said. He said most of the time he would deal and kill wild animals when they were coming against the flock and the flock didn't even know it happened. Think about it. How many times has God protected you and you don't even realize? How many cars has God stopped instead of going through that traffic light? How many times has God awakened you when you were trying to fall asleep at the wheel? How many times has God protected you from this and that and this and that? Let me take it one step further. How many times before you were saved did God protect you? That he could get you to that day? That he awakened you? That you could see your need for him and say, yes, Lord, yes. His warring care. He fights our battles. His willing care. He wants to. Can I tell you? I'm glad we don't serve a God that has to. I'm glad we serve a God that wants to. Hey, I'm glad that when I get in trouble, I'm glad that God's not up there going, well, Lord, I, I... Son, I'm just telling you right now, old Mac, he's got himself in another pickle. I know you're tired. I know you don't feel like it, but I'm telling you, just go and help a man out one more time. I know you don't want to, but just go and help him out. Hey, I want to tell you something. Our Heavenly Father, your Heavenly Father, the Bible says we can cast all our cares upon you. Why? Because he cares for us. A shepherd wants to protect the sheep. You say, why? They're his. And he loves them. (laughs) 
Lastly, thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. The shepherd's pursuit. Why does the shepherd do all this? Because it's the only way the sheep will survive. It's only the way the sheep will grow. It's for the edification of the sheep. It's for the enlargement of the sheep. Now listen to what I'm about to say in closing. Have you ever thought that sometimes your enemies are tools that God's help teaches you how dependent you are upon Him. 